Emotions are high in Barcelona. No va a permitir, que permitir que nos dividan. Intense political drama as Catalonia pushes for independence. But can the region afford to go it alone? What are the economic costs of a split from Spain? And why is the European Union so cool to the idea? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome. I'm Patty Culhane. Events are moving quickly in both Madrid and Barcelona. The political situation has been confusing, but this much is certain. Catalonia's drive for independence has already had an impact on the region's economy. Tourism has dropped off sharply. More businesses are moving their head offices out of the area, fearing political instability and financial uncertainty. And if Catalonia does eventually become independent, the costs could be huge. We begin with Al Jazeera's Andrew Simmons, who's in Barcelona. Here in the regional parliament in Barcelona, with so much emphasis on the political crisis and the risks of social unrest, Many businesses right across the region are getting worried that there may be neglect on the economy with the political developments. The figures don't read well. 1,600 companies have moved their registrations out of Catalonia since October. And it doesn't stop there. The banks are following suit. The economic growth outlook for the whole of the country has been reviewed downwards for Spain for 2018 because of social unrest in this region. And also, there are reports that the tourist industry is slumping since the referendum took place. There is one estimate from one tourism agency that the figures are 15% down. Just to give you an idea, a 20% decline in the tourism industry would really hurt. More than a billion euro would be lost if that took place. And so everyone is now really concerned about whether or not the EU position could actually damage things even more. If they lose the euro here, that will be a colossal blow. There is, we understand, some form of think tank in place of economists looking at the whole regional picture in terms of what happens in secession, but many businesses say hard times are going to be ahead, not just across the political divide and the security divide, but particularly with the economy. So let's bring in our guests. In Brussels, we have Peter Klepp, the head of the Brussels Office of Open Europe. In Barcelona, we have Sonia Andules, a lecturer at the University of Barcelona. And in Dublin, via Skype, Michael Keating, professor of the University of Aberdeen and the author of the book, The Independence of Scotland. Welcome to you all. Sonia, I want to start with you since you're there in the heart of it. We just heard those statistics from Andrew Simmons. They sound terrifying. Have you seen the impact on the ground? Is the economy suffering? It is. It, that's what it looks like. We're just seeing many MPs already leaving the parliament in a runaway. First, it was for the um, parties that have left the parliament room, which are the opposition parties. But there are many official cars coming in very fast, and it seems they are going to pick up all the MPs who have voted in favor to get away from here, as many are fearing that Spanish police could enter the parliament um, area. Peter, let me ask you this. We know that it would cost Catalonia if they took the step and tried to secede, for, secede from Spain. What would the impact be on Spain and broader Europe? Well, of course, on the short term, uh, these kind of disruptions are very costly. Uh, you could make a case that a, um, an independent Catalonia could very well survive. It's uh, bigger than, uh, than many EU member states. Um, of course, uh, more uh, competition in taxation in Europe, in regulation uh, on the long term is, uh, is a good thing. But of course, um, a very important condition for independence and uh, secession to be an economic success is that it happens peacefully. And uh, that's not clear at all uh, at the moment, uh, unfortunately. It looks like both sides are boxing some are boxing themselves in into more extremist uh, positions, uh, and, and that's very worrying, uh, frankly. 
Michael, I wanted to ask you this because there was one study by the Dutch bank ING that the financial impacts of uh, this movement, if it is successful, would far eclipse even the dire forecast we're hearing on Brexit. Uh, do you, you've studied these independence movements. Are they that costly? It depends exactly what policies are going to be followed. Uh, I actually don't agree that tax competition and regulation competition would be a good thing. There's a tendency for independent countries to try and cut their tax station, cut their social welfare, and force general standards down. The problem with the Catalan situation is the independence people have not prepared an economic plan, or at least they've not published it. This contrasts with the situation in Scotland, where there was a plan. We know more or less what kind of economic policies an independent Scotland would pursue. And of course, it's entirely dependent on keeping access to both the European and Spanish markets. In the short term, of course, as we've just heard, there is a cost because there's disruption and firms are already moving out. Now, Sonia, I wanted to get back to you because you are there on the ground. De developments are moving very quickly, obviously. Is there a, f a palpable fear there about what's happening and what could happen? I think the fear is here and it's actually quite rational. Um, maybe not fear for political, uh, sorry, for police brutality again, but fear for the unknown, for what will happen. When you begin a secessionist movement without the state's allowance, which it has been this, the case here, um, everything is uncertain and no one knows what is going to happen. It's very different from the Scottish case where Cameron said, OK, I would like you to stay, but I will hear your claim and I will follow um, legal uh, referendum. We haven't had that case here, and that has brought us into a very dramatic situation where now, uh, whatever it happens, it will be very negative, at least in the short term. Or well, that's how it looks like. I mean, I'm People going to... are scared, but... Go ahead. Sorry, go no, ahead. No, please, by all, by all means, finish your thought. Just, I would say, more the scared are worried for the uncertain. That's my general, my impression, at least. And I'm going to ask all of you to weigh in on this, because if you look at the statistics, if you look at what Catalonia would have to go through to actually become its own country, I mean, its debt is enormous. It needs uh, to get loans from Spain. It doesn't have things like its own air traffic control system, border controls. It wouldn't have any sort of uh, trading treaties. So. Do you think, and all of you, please weigh in on this. First, we're going to go to Peter. Peter, do the people understand what's uh, the potential cost here? Well, of course, to, to create your own state, um, it takes indeed a long time. Uh, you need to go through many procedures. But, um, in, you know, we've seen this in Europe in the, the last 20, 30 years. Uh, take, for example, Slovakia, which was uh, poorer than, uh, than the Czech Republic. Um, indeed, uh, in the first few years of Slovakian independence, politicians there have followed left-wing uh, policies, policies, but uh, eventually the population have voted in uh, free market liberals and they have um, uh, agreed that there should be a flat tax. And uh, this was one of the uh, recipes uh, which helped Slovakia to grow enormously. They have basically then, uh, during that period, bypassed all their neighbors. So I think uh, smaller countries are forced to eventually adopt uh, economic policies that uh, promote competitiveness. There is no alternative for them, whereas bigger countries can sort of afford to have big uh, redistributive bureaucratic uh, governments in place. Now, again, um, the big condition is that, happen that everything happens peacefully. So indeed, if Spain does not agree with Catalan independence, the question, then there's yes. major challenges ahead. Okay, Michael, quickly to you, if you could, just uh, your thoughts on that. Well, it would be essential for Catalonia to remain within the European single market. That's what makes independence viable for small countries. Uh, if it were agreed by Spain that Catalonia could become independent, then it could stay in Europe. But of course, Spain will not agree to that. Spain uh, is totally opposed to that. And, and therefore, we'd end up in a kind of limbo. Catalonia could end up uh, declaring itself independent for Spain, but not enjoying complete access to the European market. So, Sonia, to you, is that the biggest fear right there? Because could you wake up tomorrow and not be a citizen of Spain or the EU? I think the fears are all together. Um, 
we've, we've just begun to be aware, uh, I mean, maybe not those of us who are working in these issues and who have followed closer, but the majority of the society uh, seem to have just been aware of the potential economic effects the past two weeks when we've begun to see all these Catalan companies moving outside to other Spanish cities and also capitals, moves of capitals that many banks are claiming that their clients are requesting their capitals to be moved to uh, Madrid or Alicante or other places. So people are just beginning to understand all the potential effects of a unilateral um, secession. And you know, I'm looking at you and you're all across Europe, but the Catalonia, they're not alone in this. So this isn't just about this region, this country, the Catalans are of course not alone in their desire to rewrite the map of Europe. And that perhaps explains why the European Union refuses to get involved. A referendum on Scottish independence narrowly failed in 2014, and there are long-standing independence claims in Belgium's Wallonia region and on the island of Corsica, which is part of France. But the list of places in Europe with separatist movements is actually much longer, and the EU has consistently kept its distance. Peter, let me go to you first. The European Union did not get involved. Uh, they say they're, they're not in the position to negotiate. If the European Union could not be more of an effective force in these sorts of disputes, and we've just seen these disputes are all over Europe, what is the future of the EU? Why have the EU? I think it's, um, it's very wise uh, for the EU not to get involved here. This is very sensitive. This is political. And the European Union is not a political um, entity. Uh, whatever Mr. Juncker may wish, um, the EU is fundamentally a very uh, bureaucratic a body that is very good in um, making sure that countries reduce barriers to trade. It's very good in that. It should uh, focus on that. Um, every time it gets involved in politics, uh, things go wrong. Now, that said, I don't think it would be a bad idea for um, the leaders of European governments to express their opinion. And indeed, um, the Belgian Prime Minister has been very outspoken that there should be dialogue, whatever happens uh, with Catalonia and Spain, that they should, uh, they should have a dialogue, that this should not be allowed uh, to escalate in any way. Sonia, you made a face there. Looks like you want to, want to respond to that. Well, I technically agree with Peter, but what I tell my students is one thing is to be realistic, which means the European Union is a union of states, and therefore they are going to try to seek the benefit of other states. So it is quite logical from a rational perspective that they are not going to support this secession, as almost every European country has a region, as you just mentioned, that could potentially follow our path. That said, it is also true that Europe is becoming much bigger project than only the economic part and that's what they want citizens to believe so many of us are believing that Europe is more and we've said that also with the refugee crisis where many of us felt uh, the safe from uh, the European Union's behavior so many in Catalonia that feel very European are claiming maybe not to take positions but to at least enforce dialogue somehow or to really ask the Spanish government to be more open, flexible, because even if you just want to go through the legal and very, very, very strict structure, you do have a problem here that it's not going to be solved just by imposing law or imposing police force. And because of this interdependence that Peter was just mentioning, a conflict in Catalonia is a conflict for the whole Europe. So I do think that somehow, maybe not the Commission, but the Parliament or someone in Europe should do something about it and at least offer a, a place where both parties could feel comfortable to speak and to try to find common points for a solution. Because otherwise, this is just going to go worse and get protracted and stay there for a longer time. Michael, let me uh, head over to you. Are we, send, or do you think the European leaders are looking at this? We just showed the map. It is everywhere. This will not be the last one. Are leaders learning a lesson if they look at the different approaches between, let's say, the Prime Minister of the uh, UK versus how the Prime Minister of Spain has responded to this? It is not everywhere. There, there are two significant separatist movements in Europe, that is Scotland and Catalonia. There aren't any other ones. There are autonomous movements in Italy, 
uh, in Belgium looking for more self-government within the state, but there's nowhere else in Europe where independent support is over 40%. So uh, let's not uh, exaggerate this. Uh, clearly, there was a difference in Scotland because it's long been recognised that the United Kingdom is a union of nations, and in recent years, the British government has been prepared to consider secession in the case of Northern Ireland and in the case of Scotland. That's partly a matter of the constitution, which is much more relaxed in the UK than it is in the case of Spain, but it's also an understanding of the nature of the state. As for the European Union, it really hasn't provided a space for these movements that are looking for more autonomy but don't want independence. And that is where Catalonia has historically been. They weren't given that special status. And so a large section, not a majority, but a large section of Catalans moved towards independence. Similarly, in Scotland, if Scotland is given the opportunity to remain connected with the European project, uh, they won't want to separate from the United Kingdom. The problem at the moment is the United Kingdom is pulling them out of Europe. So there's, uh, there are problems on both sides in both cases here. So, Peter, let me ask you, at, at some point, does the potential cost start to change the direction of these negotiations? I'm not talking necessarily between the, the people on the street. I'm talking about the leadership of, from both Madrid and Barcelona. What does it take for them to say, enough with this going back and forth and looking tough, let's figure out how, to, how this ends? How does, what does it take to get there? Well, it looks like the next step is that Spain will indeed today declare uh, that uh, the autonomy of uh, Catalonia is to a certain degree suspended, that there have to be uh, new uh, Catalan elections within six months. And uh, as I understand it, um, the, the Spanish government is looking into uh, how many people they can actually arrest. Uh, can they only arrest the, uh, the Prime Minister of Catalonia and the ministers there? Uh, also top uh, bureaucrats, uh, only um, the leadership of the police or other police. So a very dangerous development is going on because, of course, some of the more heated elements in uh, Catalonia's independence movement uh, may well not accept this. So I think this is, this is very worrying. Um, I would say the obvious compromise would be that both sides, of course, go to the table. Uh, that also the Catalans um, uh, stress that nothing is off the table, that they are willing to discuss other options than independence. And then the obvious compromise is that every region in Spain uh, receive the same tax powers that the Basques already have, which go actually much further than what the Catalans have. And there's no reason why other Spanish regions should also not uh, get these uh, Tax power. So I would uh, think this is the most clean uh, and uh, a reasonable compromise, but I'm not sure how many people in Spain would, uh, and in Catalonia, by the way, would agree with that. Sonia, do you think that's even remotely possible? I'm agreeing with Peter this time. Um, I think the biggest problem or the, the biggest difficulty we're seeing, as in any conflict, is that both leaders are actually trapped between not only the opposite party, but inside the party. I think this past week we've seen that Mr. Rajoy was receiving a huge pressure from the most radical uh, sectors inside the government and the Spanish society, which were claiming to enforce a uh, suspension in a very harsh way and to be very um, strong and clear against the Catalan government and about uh, taking over the control. And at the same time, we've seen Mr. Puigdemont, the Catalan president, also being trapped inside uh, those here who were claiming uh, for a unilateral declaration, but some people inside his party saying, please be cautious, wait a little bit, try till the end to find a negotiated way. So I think this is just not exceptional from Catalonia, as in any conflict that we see, the difficult moment for many leaders is whether to just give wings to the opposition or to actually even face um, opposition in his own sector. And that is very complex for them to manage and to do it in a peaceful way. Now, what Peter was saying is absolutely right. Um, we are now going to go ahead with uh, taking over control. It seems the most probable thing. But again, my biggest worry is how is a Catalan society going to react against that? Because we're not ready to be taken over, I'm afraid. Now, Michael, I wanted to ask you this, because we've seen, for example, in the United States, the rise of the far right uh, electing Donald Trump. We're seeing uh, movements to secede 
uh, as you mentioned, uh, that's been debated in Scotland, obviously it's happening now in Cat Catalonia. Does this continue? No, as I said, the, 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 there's not a widespread problem of separatism in Europe, if you, if you think of it as, as a problem. Yes, the old political parties are breaking down, the old political alignments are breaking down. The striking thing about this confrontation between Spain and or the Spanish and the Catalan governments is that these are both very weak governments, very weak leaders. Their parties, the PDCAT and the PP, have gone through really terrible corruption scandals. Uh, the politicians are discredited and they're using nationalism on both sides as a means of shoring up their support. And that makes finding a negotiated solution all the more difficult. Well, I'm going to ask all three of you, if I could, longer term, how does this impact the European Union, regardless of how it turns out, whether they can actually sit down and negotiate or we see uh, police and arrests move in? So what is the long term impact on the European Union? Sonia, let me start with you on that. Um, I just think for the European Union, um, the impact could just be limited if this gets somehow uh, finished, even if it's in a bad situation, but somehow finished. But if it keeps being present there and we keep having all this international media's attention, it could become uh, something that um, could damage somehow the European Union in terms of internal cohesion and uh, even economically. But I'm going to let Peter go ahead with that. Um, I'd like to hear what he has to say about Good point. Peter, to you. Uh, sure. Um, so I think indeed uh, this uh, shows that people in Europe really um, want more flexibility. There's um, all over Europe um, more a demand for um, uh, basically having more control over one's own fate. Uh, I would say that's why we see all this populist movement in, in Europe, um, whether they're from the left or the right, this is what they sort of have in common. They feel they're losing control over their own fate. And indeed also the Catalan, the Scottish independence movements, uh, they of course have always existed, but in the last 10 years they've become much more popular. And, and um, again, uh, if we wonder how uh, to deal with that, I think we have to look at Switzerland. Switzerland is a country where uh, there's a lot of decentralization, where the decentralized entities, the cantons, uh, can uh, decide over a taxation policy to a much larger extent than what is the case elsewhere. So, uh, and this really helps to keep Switzerland together. Nobody uh, in Switzerland wants to, uh, wants to sort of secede from the country because the country allows a lot of flexibility. People are generally happy with how Switzerland is. So if the EU is wondering how can we uh, become more stable, uh, they have to look at Switzerland. And if Spain um, is wondering how can we become more stable, they have to again also look at uh, what the Swiss have done. Michael, last question uh, of the show is to you. Do you have any hope that these leaders would give up some of that all-important power throughout Europe? I mean, leaders don't tend to happily give up what they control. Well, Europe is all about pooling sovereignty. It's not about subordinating the nation state. It's about tackling problems in, in common. And at the same time, you're getting a process of decentralization within states. States are being transformed. And that's worked very well. But if the European leaders simply back the most intransigent elements in the Spanish government, that doesn't do Europe a lot of credit. It gives the impression that Europe is taking a very rigid position, as it has on austerity on other kinds of issues. And that could weaken support for the European project in the long run, if it's insensitive to these kinds of demands okay. for more local control over people's affairs. This has been very informative. I want to thank my guests, Peter Klepp, Sonia Andoles, and Michael Keating. Very interesting times, and we shall see what happens. Thank you all so much for joining us. And thank you for watching. You can see this program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Patty Colhane, and the whole team, bye for now.